Last week, um, Exodus chapters 5 and 6 began this preparation for the Lord forcing Pharaoh to give up the Israelites and allow them to leave Egypt. Moses and Aaron were in Egypt. They had con confronted Pharaoh with the mildest demand that would be put upon him. Let my people go out to the desert for three days to worship Jehovah. But we were also told that God had predetermined that the Pharaoh's heart would be hard and that Jehovah would himself harden Pharaoh's heart further. And then Pharaoh would harden his own heart even more. And then the Lord would harden the king of Egypt's heart to an even greater level and so on until the plagues that were poured out upon Egypt were so devastating that the Pharaoh would not only let Israel go, he demanded they'd leave. Well, the Pharaoh reacted to Moses' demand by stopping the shipment of straw, which was a standard ingredient for mud bricks. And this is something the Israelites counted on to manufacture the countless millions of mud bricks for the cities and the fortresses that they were building for Egypt. Rather, they were told they'd have to go out and obtain straw on their own, even though their quota of bricks couldn't decrease. Well, such a demand was utterly impossible to meet. And Pharaoh, who's irrational and paranoid, hatred of the Hebrews was behind this nonsensical demand, orders that the foremen of the Israelites are to be beaten for not producing as much as before. The foremen go into the Pharaoh, personally asking how it is that he thinks they can possibly accomplish what he's insisting upon, and his answer is, hey, this isn't my problem. So the foremen go to Moses and Aaron. They blame them for what's happened, causing Moses to question whether he is adequate to even do what the Lord has told him to do and whether or not he's going about doing what it is that Jehovah has instructed him to do in the right way. Well, the Lord's response to Moses about this is what begins Exodus chapter 7. So open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 7. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it is page 66. We'll read the whole chapter. But Adonai said to Moshe, I've put you in the place of God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother will be your prophet. You are to say everything I order you, and Aaron your brother is to speak to Pharaoh and tell him to let the people of Israel leave his land. But I will make him hard-hearted, and even though I will increase my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies, my people, the sons of Israel, out of the land of Egypt with great acts of judgment. Then when I stretch out my hand over Egypt and bring the people of Israel out from among them, the Egyptians will know that I'm out of nine. Now Moses and Aaron did exactly what Adonai ordered them to do. Moses was 80 years old, Aaron 83, when they spoke to Pharaoh. And Adonai said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle... Tell Aaron to take his staff and throw it down in front of Pharaoh so that it can become a snake. Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and did this as Adonai had ordered. And Aaron threw down his staff in front of Pharaoh and his servants and it turned into a snake. But Pharaoh in turn called for the sages and sorcerers and they too, the magicians of Egypt, did the same thing, making use of their secret arts. Each one threw his staff down and they turned into snakes. But Aaron's staff swallowed up theirs. Nevertheless, Pharaoh, made, Pharaoh was made hard-hearted. He didn't listen to them, as Adonai had said would happen. Adonai said to Moshe, Pharaoh stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning when he goes out to the water. Stand on the riverbank to confront him. Take in your hand the staff, which was turned into a snake, and say to him, Adonai, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you to say, let my people go so that they can worship me in the desert. Till now you haven't listened. So Adonai says, this will let you know that I'm Adonai. I will take the staff in my hand and strike the water in the river. It will be turned into blood. The fish in the river will die. The river will stink. And the Egyptians won't want to drink water from the river. 
Adonai said to Moshe, say to Aaron, take your staff, reach out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, canals, ponds, and all their reservoirs, so that they can turn into blood. There will be blood throughout the whole land of Egypt, even in the wooden buckets and in the stone jars. Moshe and Aharon did exactly what Adonai ordered. He raised the staff, and inside of the Pharaoh and his servants, he struck the water in the river. All the water in the river was turned into blood. The fish in the river died. The river stank so badly that the Egyptians couldn't drink its water. There was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same thing with their secret arts, so that Pharaoh was made hard-hearted and didn't listen to them, as Adonai had said would happen. Pharaoh just turned, went back to his palace without taking any of this to heart. All the Egyptians dug around the river for water to drink because they couldn't drink the river water. Well, seven days after Adonai had struck the river, Adonai said to Moshe, go into Pharaoh and say to him, here is what Adonai says, let my people go so that they can worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will strike all your territory with frogs. The river will swarm with frogs. They will go up, enter your palace, go into your bedroom, onto your bed. They'll enter the houses of your servants, of your people, go into your ovens, your kneading bowls. The frogs will climb all over you, your people and your servants. One of the great challenges I think we believers have is trying to understand just who Yeshua is. Where exactly does he fit into the Godhead? But also how it is that he's a man and yet he's God. Even more while the Lord pronounces at every turn that his nature is echad, one. Completely unified. That we have these multiple essences or entities of him with the three chief ones being named Yehovah, another named Yeshua, and the third one we simply call the Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh. Now I promise you, if you actually understand how all this works, you need to write a book because you'll become very well known and wealthy. That said, Nothing helps to understand this amazing mystery more than understanding Moses and Aaron's relationship with each other and with God. There are precisely two mediators in all of Scripture, in all of history. Moses and later Jesus the Christ. Now generally speaking, the relationship between Yeshua and the Father is patterned after the relationship between Moses and the Father. The obvious difference, of course, is that Moses was not of actual God substance, but Yeshua was. Therefore, let the impact of the words of Exodus 7 verses 1 and 2 sink in a little bit. I want to point out that in the original Hebrew, the words of verses 1 and 2 are these. Yehovah said to Moses, See, I place you in the role of Elohim to Pharaoh with your brother Aaron being your Navi. Now, that is the father places Moses, the mediator, in the role of a divine being, a god, with Aaron being the earthly spokesman for the divine being. Navi is the typical Hebrew word that in other places are translated as prophet. Do we not see that same pattern with Christ? The Father puts Yeshua in the role of divine God, and there will also be a prophet as a spokesman to pave the way for Yeshua, John the Baptist. God, mediator, prophet. This was Moses' situation. This is our Savior's situation. And both answer to an even higher authority in heaven. This arrangement was perfectly understandable to Pharaoh. After all, Pharaoh was considered divine, at least he thought of himself that way. 
And now Moses would be the divine negotiator for his God, Yehovah. Of course, in reality, Pharaoh was no more a god than was Moses a god. The difference is, Pharaoh was delusional. Moses was indeed imbued with the power of God. I mean, we're talking a mismatch here. So as we move along, I want you to pay close attention to how Moses behaves, what he does, what the Lord expects of him, because it's a shadow, a pattern of what will be Yeshua's ministry. Well, chapter 7 begins this series of plagues that God will use to strike Egypt and eventually result in the king of Egypt letting the Israelites leave. Now, it's important to understand the great cost it would have been to Pharaoh in Egypt to allow these Hebrews to immigrate in mass out of Egypt. And Pharaoh was very paranoid about the possibility of this happening. Now, remember, up to this point, the only demand made upon Pharaoh was to let the Hebrews go a three days journey into the desert to worship God. The implication was they'd return. But Pharaoh didn't trust this. He figured that if he gave his permission, they would just keep on going and never return. In fact, in later verses, we'll see Pharaoh cave in a couple of times. Then he would demand that Israel leave their flocks behind to ensure that they'll come back. Egypt had a population of around 10 to 12 million people at this time. Israel made up something between two and a half and three million of that number. Now think this through. This means that Egypt stood to lose perhaps 25% of its entire population, which amounted to almost its entire workforce if Israel was let go. Imagine if in the U.S., which now stands at a little over 300 million population, if we were in a matter of a few days, suddenly lose 75 million people. And that these 75 million people were our construction workers, our factory workers, our automobile assemblers, our field workers, our food preparers, steel makers, electricians, plumbers, heavy equipment operators, cargo handlers, truck drivers. Can you imagine that? And the effects would be devastating. Our entire economy would collapse. Food distribution, housing, automobile repair, utilities, all the most basic services that we take for granted would be interrupted. For a long, long time. And unlike that 24-hour power failure we had a few years ago now in the Northeast U.S., this ongoing effect of this event would last for years, no doubt decades. The U.S. would overnight become a second-rate power, a bankrupt nation unlikely ever again to attain its former greatness. You see... This is what faced Pharaoh if he released the Hebrews. Is it any wonder that he refused? Yet what we will see is that in the end, the result was that God crushed Egypt for refusing his instruction. And then Egypt was devastated even further by losing Israel anyway. It was a double whammy. Whatever difficulties we may face in obediently submitting to the will of God, no matter how hard it might seem at the time, the consequences are going to be considerably less than when we, in our refusal, force God to enforce His will upon us. Once we as a nation or as a family or as an individual have traveled down the path of rebellious error and we fall into the valley of sin and we remain there long enough, it's grueling 
It's an epic battle to climb back up to that mountaintop of purity and harmony with God. We're like drug addicts that are, once you're drawn in and you live in that condition for a while, you realize that the pain, the perseverance it's going to take to shake off that addiction is probably more than we can bear. We look around us and we see that very few ever can. Most just give in and give up. I mean, we may rationalize or even deny our condition because we don't want to face what lays ahead. What's the solution? Don't go there in the first place. Obey God and live. But if you ever do find yourself there, be realistic enough to know that while the fight back towards a right relationship with God is going to be hard, you can do it with God's help, provided you're sincere and you adjust your ways to meet God's ways. And the rewards are going to be worth the effort. Well, before we get into the, all the plagues, I want to set the stage. First of all, the Hebrew word typically translated as plague as nera, nera. Now, nera is a generic word. It simply means stricken, as in some type of a blow upon something or someone, usually with the idea that the blow is a punishment for an offense. So this, this strike, this blow, can take many forms. It could be a sickness, it could be a pestilence, it could be an earthquake, it could be the, the loss of a loved one to death, the loss of wealth and prosperity. It could, of course, also be a plague. So calling all ten ne uh, nega strokes against Egypt, against Egypt plagues, in our more modern sense of the word plague, it's a little bit off course, although a couple of those stro strokes were most certainly plague-like. Next, properly speaking, there were only nine strokes or plagues, with the tenth actually being the judgment. The first nine were to convince Pharaoh to avoid the judgment that Jehovah had said would occur if that great king wouldn't release Israel. The judgment was that God by his own hand would do what? Kill all the firstborn of Egypt. That was judgment. Now these strokes that were inflicted upon, inflicted upon Egypt were therefore actually not ten, but rather three sets of three strokes each, progressively more severe in their nature. The first set of three involved the entire land of Egypt and everybody in it. Egyptians, Hebrews, visitors, all were affected by them. They were generally mild, causing a little more than inconvenience and discomfort. The next two sets of three, that is the next six strokes, were visited only upon the Egyptians. God in this way divided and separated his people from all others in the land of Egypt. That is, he made a distinction between Israel and everybody else. While Pharaoh had been personally informed in his palace by Moses and Aaron that Israel had been set apart for God, the people of Egypt would only find this out by experiencing that God m makes a distinction between Israel and everyone else. One can only imagine how quickly the news spread beyond Egypt that these terrible blows were suffered by the Egyptian people and included the God-man Pharaoh himself, but it left the Hebrews, strangely enough, completely unaffected. Now indeed these plagues were of supernatural origin. They were miracles from the power of God. However, in reality, 
What occurred in each of them also occurred in nature from time to time, though not to the extent now happening. It is completely normal, according to the scriptures, that God would use ordinary events and circumstances and nature's various elements in an extraordinary way to achieve his purposes. What separated these nine devastating, devastating strokes from the same types of occurrences which occasionally appeared naturally was it occurred when Moses commanded them. And they came at an abnormal time of year. And they were greatly more severe than had ever occurred before. And they happened one right after the other. It left no doubt to the Hebrews or to the Egyptians that the God of Israel controlled every natural process known to man. We know from the scriptures, we read it in chapter 7, that the first stroke lasted for seven days. We also know that the judgment upon Egypt, what we usually call the tenth plague, when God killed all of Egypt's firstborn, and which marks the first Passover, happened on one night on the 14th of Nisan, which is early spring. The seventh plague struck Egypt's agriculture. And the Bible tells us the state of development of certain field crops, which gives us then a good idea of the season it happened in, which would have been around the end of January, the 1st of February, according to our calendar. Various Bible scholars have used this and other data to speculate that from the first plague to the final judgment, the killing of the firstborns, was over an entire period of about 10 months from beginning to end. That is, the event began in May, June, ended the following March, April. Some see it as a little less, maybe eight months. Either way, we see that this series of blows against Egypt played out over an extended period of time and that Pharaoh and his advisors had ample time to consider what was happening, what their response should be. And what should that response have been? Repentance and compliance. In between each plague, the government and the people likely gained some amount of false hope when the effects seemed to subside. And then life at least moved a little bit back towards normal. Yet what actually happened was that as each day passed after a calamity, Pharaoh grew complacent. He was less concerned that there would even be another one. He just returned to his normal day-to-day -day activities, addressing his ongoing agenda and affairs of state. I mean, what could be a better picture of our human nature than this? A few days, I remember, after 9-11, a great part of our nation filled their pantries with extra food and water. Plastic sheeting, duct tape, a lot of duct tape. Kept, kept their gas tanks filled. We heightened our senses for any sign of something abnormal occurring. Our churches, our synagogues overflowed. Volunteerism skyrocketed. Now, 15 years later, our sanctuaries are as sparsely filled as before. Our blood banks run dry. For a time, this nation's believers wondered out loud how we might have displeased the Lord. Why his hand of protection, protection had been lifted from us. Now, we're right back to hearing too many pastors say once again, oh, God doesn't ever punish his people. He was simply evil doing what evil does. We're more concerned with the inconvenience that the extra security at our airports and office buildings causes than what might happen if it wasn't there. 
People haven't changed a whole lot in 3,500 years, have they? Well, one final peculiarity about these nine strokes against Egypt, we'll move on. <clears throat> the third stroke, remember I told you there were three, three sets of three strokes each. The third stroke of each group of three always came unannounced to Pharaoh. That is, two calamities would occur in succession, but each time Moses would first warn the Pharaoh and explain the nature of these coming punishments. Then a third terrible one would happen, but Pharaoh would not be forewarned. So plagues one and two, then four and five, then seven and eight occurred with advance notice to the king of Egypt. Plagues three, six, and nine happened with no prior notice to Pharaoh. To Pharaoh and his brain trust, it appeared that Aaron and Moses were responsible for this series of calamities, just as the king's magicians were given credit for their own sorcery. Yet it was hard to pin plagues 3, 6, and 9 on Moses and Aaron since they were not present before Pharaoh to tell him what was about to happen. God used the third of each series of three plagues to show Pharaoh and his cronies that Jehovah was the author of these things, not as mediator, Moses, not as prophet, Aaron, and that Jehovah God of Israel was supreme over all things everywhere, including Egypt. Now, understanding this helps us as we look back at the very first verse of chapter 7 where God sends Aaron and Moses back to Pharaoh with another demand. And Jehovah says to Moses, I will make you as God to Pharaoh. Indeed, this first stroke Moses was about to announce through Aaron would appear to Pharaoh as though it was Moses' doing. So by Pharaoh's thinking, indeed, Moses was as a God to make such supernatural things happen at his command. And by the way, Pharaoh knew full well he couldn't do these things that Moses did well, in verse 3, God tells Moses that he will harden Pharaoh's already rebellious and defiant heart for the purposes of showing Egypt my signs and wonders in order that Egypt will know that I am Jehovah. So what we see here is that it's not just a matter of convincing the Pharaoh. God wanted Egypt, the millions of common people, to be made acutely aware of his power and glory. Now, certainly, it would take Pharaoh's permission for Israel to go, but God wanted all of the people of Egypt to learn who he is. Why? Undoubtedly so they would give up their false gods and worship him. Pharaoh was never going to worship Jehovah. He was only going to be defeated and then comply grudgingly. Pharaoh's heart had long ago passed the point of no return. Now, this brings us to a question that's less difficult when we're applying it to the Pharaoh, a lot more difficult when we apply it to our own lives. It's this. What do we gain from, first, believing that God, Jehovah, exists and he is powerful, and two, by complying with God's instructions? What do we gain? Pharaoh most certainly believed, even before the final plague, that Jehovah was a real God, and he was certainly very powerful. Oh, he believed that. He also, in the end, complied. He let Israel go, knowing it would mean the end of Egypt as a regional power. Does that mean that Pharaoh was then righteous? before God Almighty. I mean, we could all pretty easily answer that question. No. But how about us? How about you? How about me? What if we believe that God exists and we comply with most of the instructions He's given to us, 
Are we now righteous before God? Depending on which Christian denomination you might come from, the answers could be different. We have here in the Exodus story of Pharaoh the frightening and perfectly clear answer to my question. Simply performing whatever act that God has commanded of you legalistically or just from the fear of punishment does not bring righteousness. Believing that God exists and He is real does not bring righteousness. One of the worst words I believe ever chosen to explain a righteous relationship with God is the word believe. How often I've heard an evangelist call unbelievers to belief in God that they might be saved. Well, Pharaoh believed in the God of Israel. Oh, yes, he certainly did. Righteousness is not acquired by adherence to God's commands nor to the doubtless belief that he exists. Righteousness is acquired by trusting God. And then Jehovah in turn declaring you or me to be righteous. Pharaoh believed, but he didn't trust God. What's trust? Theologians have argued over that precise definition for centuries. What all of them do agree on, though, is that the basis of trust is faith and commitment that God is who He says He is and that He is able to do what He says He will and that our responses to Him come from a type of love that can't even exist within us, unless he puts it there. The principles we find in the Old Testament really aren't surprising, are they? Genesis 15 says that Abraham was seen as righteous. Why? Only because he trusted God. So God credited that trust to him as righteousness. And now we see here in Exodus that acknowledging that God exists and legalistically or fearfully following His commandments, that doesn't bring righteousness. Principles that we typically thought only came into existence during New Testament times are right here in the Torah. So these two elderly men, Moses, 80, Aaron, 83, trudge back into Pharaoh and they do all that God commanded of them. And in verse 10 we see the last warning shot fired over Pharaoh's bow before God plays rough. Moses handed Aaron his staff, gave Pharaoh the sign that the angel of Jehovah had given Moses at the burning bush. Moses' staff became a serpent. Why a serpent? See, because Pharaoh literally wore a serpent upon his regal headdress. The serpent being the Egyptian symbol of kingly authority and healing. This was a direct insult and challenge to Pharaoh's authority. Through Satan's power to counterfeit, Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's sorcerers imitated the miracle and they turned their staffs into snakes. But God's power overwhelmed that of the magicians, and Moses' staff swallowed up their snakes. As predicted, Pharaoh just scoffed at this demonstration of divine power. The last warning ignored, the battle begins in earnest. In verse 15, God instructs Moses to go out to the Nile the following morning and to meet Pharaoh there. Now, how Moses knew where to meet Pharaoh is the subject of a lot of conjecture. Some believe that there was a regular religious rite that occurred at the same spot every day in which Pharaoh was involved. Others believed it could have been part of Pharaoh's normal morning routine to go out to the Nile and perhaps bathe. In any case, there's no chance Pharaoh would have been alone. 
His royal court would have been with him. Well, Moses pronounces to Pharaoh the coming of the first stroke. The first nega, or more correctly, negef. Moses smiles the water, uh, smites the water of the Nile with his shepherd's staff. The Nile turns blood red. Not just the great river itself, but all the canals and ponds and reservoirs that the Egyptians had built, as well as the many branches of the Nile, turned bloody red. Now, this miracle happened over the full length and breadth of Egypt, affecting everyone. Nobody was spared from its effects, and that includes the Hebrews, because they counted on the Nile for water just like everybody else. Even water that was not currently in contact with the Nile, but that had come from it, turned to blood. In the cooking pots, in the storage containers, everything that held water taken from the Nile. Now, interestingly, Egypt sorcerers were able to imitate this, just as they were able to counterfeit the turning of staffs into snakes. And of course, what would have been better is if Pharaoh's magicians could have overcome and restored the Nile to its freshness. But they didn't, undoubtedly, because they couldn't. One would have thought this awesome spectacle of the Nile turning blood red and the royals receiving reports that it occurred everywhere in Egypt might have swayed the Pharaoh. It didn't. Why? Well, in addition to the hardened condition of the Pharaoh's heart, many Bible scholars believe that what occurred here was something that the Egyptians had seen before, just in smaller measure. Every year, at the time of the rise of the Nile, silt would color the water a characteristic red, and the rich nutrients contained in the silt spurred the growth of microorganisms to create an effect that most of us who live near the ocean are familiar with, a red tide. This eats up the necessary oxygen in the water. It kills millions of fish, and it causes a pretty bad stench. This fits very well, not only with the scriptural description of what occurred, but also with the God pattern of using nature, but in extraordinary ways. Of course, the miracle was that Moses caused it to happen upon his command. It happened when the Nile was not in its rising season. It even contaminated already drawn water in vessels which where the water was being stored. Now, could this have actually been blood, real blood, which is what most Bible versions say? Maybe. I'll give it a good positive maybe. The Hebrew word used here is dam, D-A-M, dam, and it means blood, but dam also means bloody, blood-like, and it's even used when referring to wine as the blood of the grape, the dam of the grape. So the use of the word dam can, it often does, by the way, in the Bible, refer to a color. It doesn't necessitate our assuming that Nile became literal blood. I'm not dogmatic about all this, but when you take this plague in context with all the others, literal blood seems out of place, as all the other plagues used obvious elements of nature, except the tenth one, of course. The other issue is that spiritual spe spiritually speaking, blood's for atonement. Certainly there's no atonement for Egypt going on here by turning the Nile blood to blood. Now add to that that we're told in verse 24 that everyone had to dig around the Nile for water to drink. In other words, beachgoers, just like when you go to the beach, as you get near the water line, you dig a little hole in the sand, what happens? That hole quickly fills with water that seeps through the sand, right? Just as used in reverse, especially here in Florida and other places where stormwater runoff is channeled into ponds, so the solids and the pollutants are filtered out as the water returns back into the aquifer. So the people of Egypt were able to have the sand filter the red silt 
and microorganisms out of the tainted water sufficiently they could drink it. No amount of filtering would have solved the problem if the water was no longer water, but it was blood. You can't filter blood well enough for that, certainly not with sand. Besides, the se seven days with absolutely no drinkable water in Egypt would have been a death sentence to hundreds of thousands. And that most certainly was not the aim in this stroke, particularly because the Hebrews were subject to this as well. Jehovah now sends Moses back to the so far unimpressed, unmoved king of Egypt. In verse 26, Jehovah says to Moses to tell Pharaoh, set my people free. And if he'll do it, rather he won't do it, guess what God's going to do next? Frogs. He's going to send a horde of frogs. Now first off, if you don't have a Bible that reflects the original Hebrew structure, you don't have a verse 26. Instead, this shows up as um, verse 1 of chapter 8. It's not a big deal. It doesn't change anything. But for the sake of everyone who doesn't have the older Hebrew Bible structure, we'll go ahead and stop at this point and, and we'll read chapter 8. So let's read chapter 8 of Exodus. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it starts on page 67. Exodus chapter 8. Adonai said to Moshe, say to Aharon, Reach out your hand with your staff over the rivers, canals, and ponds and cause frogs to come up into the land of Egypt. Well, Aharon put out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. But the magicians did the same with their secret arts and brought up frogs into the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Intercede with Adonai to take the frogs away from me and my people and I will let the people go and sacrifice to Adonai. Moses said to Pharaoh, Not only that, but you can have the honor of naming the time when I pray for you, your servants and your people, to be rid of these frogs, both yourselves and your homes, and that they stay only in the river. And he answered, tomorrow. Moses said, it'll be as you have said. And from this you will learn that, and I, our God, has no equal. The frogs will leave you and your homes, also your servants and your people. They will stay in the river only. Well, Moshe and Aharon left Pharaoh's presence, and Moshe cried out to Adonai about the frogs he brought on to Pharaoh. Adonai did as Moshe had asked. The frogs died in the households, courtyards, and fields. They gathered them in heaps till the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that he had, given, had been given some relief, he made himself hard-hearted and wouldn't listen to them, just as Adonai had said it would happen. Adonai said to Moshe, say to Aharon, Aharon, reach out with your staff and strike the dust on the ground. It will become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. They did it. Aaron reached out his hand with his staff and he struck the dust of the ground and there were lice on people and animals. All the dust on the ground became lice throughout the whole, hand of, whole land of Egypt. The magicians tried with their secret arts to produce lice. They couldn't. There were lice on people and animals. And then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh was made hard-hearted so he wouldn't listen to, them, listen to them just as Adonai had said would happen. Adonai said to Moses, get up early in the morning. Stand before Pharaoh when he goes out to the water and say to him, here is what Adonai says, let my people go so that they can worship me. Otherwise, if you won't let my people go, I will send swarms of insects on you, your servants, your people, into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians will be full of swarms of insects, likewise the ground they stand on. But I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people live. So no swarms of insects will be there so that you can realize that I am Adonai right here in this land. Yes, I will distinguish between my people and your people, and this sign will happen by tomorrow. Adonai did it. Terrible swarms of insects went into Pharaoh's palace and into all of his servants' houses. The insects ruined the entire land of Egypt. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Go, sacrifice to your God here in the land. But Moses replied, It would be inappropriate for us to do that. Because the animal we sacrifice to Adonai, our God, is an abomination to the Egyptians. Won't the Egyptians stone us to death? If before their very eyes we sacrifice what they consider an abomination? 
No, we will go three days' journey into the desert and sacrifice to Adonai our God as he's ordered us to do. Pharaoh, Pharaoh said, I will let you go so that you can sacrifice to Adonai your God in the desert. Oak only you're not to go very far away. Intercede on my behalf. Moses said, all right, I'm going to go away from you and I will intercede with Adonai so that tomorrow these swarms of insects will leave Pharaoh, his servants, and his people. But just make sure that Pharaoh stops playing games with the people by preventing them from going and sacrificing to Adonai. Moshe left Pharaoh and interceded with Adonai, and Adonai did what Moshe had asked. He removed the swarms of insects from Pharaoh, his servants, and his people. Not one remained. But this time, too, Pharaoh made himself stubborn, and he didn't let the people go. Why frogs? Because a frog was the animal symbol of fertility in Egypt. And Heket was the frog fertility goddess. So here we have a further assault on the Egyptian false religion. But this inundation of frogs is also a naturally occurring phenomenon along the Nile, only in much smaller numbers than we have here. This typically occurs along the Nile in the October-November time frame. So we have a kind of a mile marker to watch the progression of strokes upon Egypt that had begun in the summer. And now the latest one, the frogs, was probably occurring in the fall. Now the supernatural nature of this happening was again, Moses directed it. That the number of frogs was enormously on, beyond imagination and rather than simply hanging around the banks of the Nile for a short time near the puddles of water is what usually happens. These frogs wound up in people's homes, their bedrooms, even inside their bread ovens. Now typically when these frogs emerge from the mud, they became a feast for the ibis that inhabited the shores of the Great River. It's not unlike in Africa. When after the rainy season, summer comes, water holes dry up, and millions of birds feast on fish that have been trapped in these tiny ponds, overcrowded. They don't have any means of escape. These Nile frogs are a very unique variety, by the way. They are very small. They can barely leap or hop. They are also known for generating the most obnoxious, never-ending croaking. Thankfully, they have a very short life cycle. Living just long enough to lay eggs for the next generation and staying around for perhaps three weeks in the moist sand the entire length of the Nile. So one of the miraculous elements of this frog infestation was they found their way into the driest of places. That's the significance of talking about how they went into the bread ovens which is a place where likely they had never been found before. Actually, the fact that they flooded the dry landscape that began just yards beyond the Nile's banks was also unheard of. Well, now, once again, Pharaoh summons his sorcerers. They imitate what Moses and Aaron had done. I guess it was important to Pharaoh to play down any power that Moses and his God seemed to have because it was certainly irrational to simply add to the already out of control frog plague. And as in the first plague, while the Nile waters, with the Nile waters becoming blood red, undrinkable, Pharaoh's magicians could imitate to a degree what Moses commanded, but guess what they couldn't do? They couldn't overturn it couldn't make it go away. Now let us learn from this an important attribute of Satan who is the source of all power. Hear this. Satan is the source of all power that is not God. What we are commonly aware of is that Satan can, to a degree, imitate. He can counterfeit. Supernatural occurrences brought about by God. This is attested to all throughout the scriptures, and it's demonstrated for us right here in Exodus. Exodus 
But what Satan can never, un never do is undo what God has decided. Satan cannot defeat acts of God. Some elements of the plagues, the strokes, could be mimicked to a degree. They couldn't be stopped. They couldn't be reversed. This is a truth that we can be very thankful for. We can be comforted by it. And we should remember, as we find ourselves dealing with matters from time to time, which seem to have demonic forces, this is the principle. And as you read in times prophecies about the coming of the Antichrist, the beast filled with Satan's power, notice how he can never stop, reverse, or undo what God has done. God only allowed Satan enough power to mimic. And only that to a point that really but serves to bring about God's plan. Well, pretty quickly... The frogs apparently got to Pharaoh because here in only the second of what would prove to be nine strokes, Pharaoh tells Moses to plead with Jehovah to call off the attack of the frogs. And in return, he will let Israel go into the wilderness to offer sacrifices. And as if to underscore God's power, Moses asked Pharaoh, hey, when would you like him to disappear? You call it, we'll do it. I mean, talk about rubbing it in. But there was a very important point to all this. This act of Moses letting Pharaoh determine the time and the place for the frog removal activities, something that neither the Pharaoh or his magicians could do, served to emphasize the God of he the Hebrews' enormous sway and power over nature and over time. Moses says, okay. It'll be just as you say, Pharaoh. And he proceeds to go to God with Pharaoh's request. Now, just a little note here. While Moses was most certainly right to immediately proceed to God, Moses already had the authority to call off the frogs. Now, remember, Jehovah told Moses, you will be as God. If Moses spoke it, it would be as if God spoke it. And Moses had agreed to Pharaoh's request that it be tomorrow that the fogs were removed, frogs were removed. So it's a done deal right there at that moment. Nothing further was required. Well, the next day, as Moses promised Pharaoh, the frogs just suddenly died. The people had little choice but to go gather up the millions and mis millions of little frog carcasses, put them in a pile in order to get them out of their houses, their pathways, out of their cooking utensils. I mean, what a stench went up all over Egypt as these little tiny croakers died. Then they began to decay. And the Pharaoh, as he would do a number of times, changed his mind. Eh, I'm not going to release Israel to go worship God. As our Bibles correctly say, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Notice that opposed to it being God who hardened Pharaoh's heart this time, it was Pharaoh who hardened his own heart. Little footnote. We're going to end it for the day. Associated with Pharaoh changing his mind, there's some humor here that our Bibles, English Bible translations mask so we don't get to enjoy it. Verse 11, if your Bible had the extended chapter 7 of the more traditional Bible, verse 15, says, when Pharaoh saw there was relief from the frogs, he hardened his heart. Well, the Hebrew word that is translated relief, or some Bibles say respite, is revacha. Revacha. It literally means breathing room. So here we're told that the whole land stank from the piles of dead frogs, but when the Pharaoh finally got some, what? Breathing room. When the stench died down, he changed his mind. In the original Hebrew, it was intended that the word stench versus breathing room was to play off of one another. Cute, huh? 
Okay, this is a good place to end our lesson this week. We'll get back into it next time.